The Battle of Belgium or Belgian Campaign, often referred to within Belgium as the 18 Days Campaign French, Campagne des 18 jours, Dutch, Eichtiendags Veldtocht, formed part of the Greater Battle of France, an offensive campaign by Germany during the Second World War. It took place over 18 days in May 1940 and ended with the German occupation of Belgium following the surrender of the Belgian army. On 10 May 1940, Germany invaded Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and Belgium under the operational plan Fall Gelb Case Yellow. The Allied armies attempted to halt the German army in Belgium, believing it to be the main German thrust. After the French had fully committed the best of the Allied armies to Belgium between 10 and 12 May, the Germans enacted the second phase of their operation, a breakthrough, or sickle cut, through the Ardennes, and advanced toward the English Channel. The German army here reached the channel after five days, encircling the Allied armies. The Germans gradually reduced the pocket of Allied forces, forcing them back to the sea. The Belgian army surrendered on 28 May 1940, ending the battle. The Battle of Belgium included the first tank battle of the war, the Battle of Hannet. It was the largest tank battle in history at the time but was later surpassed by the battles of the North African Campaign and the Eastern Front. The battle also included the Battle of Fort Eben Mil, the first strategic airborne operation using paratroopers ever attempted. The German official history stated that in the 18 days of bitter fighting, the Belgian army were tough opponents, and spoke of the extraordinary bravery of its soldiers. The Belgian collapse forced the Allied withdrawal from continental Europe. The British Royal Navy subsequently evacuated Belgian ports during Operation Dynamo, allowing the British Expeditionary Force BEF, along with many Belgian and French soldiers, to escape capture and continue military operations. France reached its own armistice with Germany in June 1940. Belgium was occupied by the Germans until the autumn of 1944, when it was liberated by the Western Allies. Pre-battle plans. Topic. Belgium's strained alliances The Belgian strategy for a defence against German aggression faced political as well as military problems. In terms of military strategy, the Belgians were unwilling to stake everything on a linear defence of the Belgian-German border, in an extension of the Maginot Line. Such a move would leave the Belgians vulnerable to a German assault in their rear, through an attack on the Netherlands. Such a strategy would also rely on the French to move quickly into Belgium and support the garrison there. Politically, the Belgians did not trust the French. Marshal Philippe Payton had suggested a French strike at Germany's Ruhr area using Belgium as a springboard in October 1930 and again in January 1933. Belgium feared it would be drawn into a war regardless, and sought to avoid that eventuality. The Belgians also feared being drawn into a war as a result of the French Soviet Pact of May 1935. The Franco-Belgian agreement stipulated Belgium was to mobilize if the Germans did, but what was not clear was whether Belgium would have to mobilize in the event of a German invasion of Poland. The Belgians much preferred an alliance with the United Kingdom. The British had entered the First World War in response to the German violation of Belgian neutrality. The Belgian Channel ports had offered the German Imperial Navy valuable bases, and such an attack would offer the German Kriegsmarine and the Luftwaffe bases to engage in strategic offensive operations against the United Kingdom in the coming conflict. But the British government paid little attention to the concerns of the Belgians. The lack of this commitment ensured the Belgian withdrawal from the Western Alliance, the day before the remilitarization of the Rhineland. The lack of opposition to the remilitarization served to convince the Belgians that France and Britain were unwilling to fight for their own strategic interests, let alone Belgium's. The Belgian general staff was determined to fight for its own interests, alone if necessary. <laughs> Belgian place in Allied strategy The French were infuriated at King Leopold III's open declaration of neutrality in October 1936. The French army saw its strategic assumptions undermined, it could no longer expect closer cooperation with the Belgians in defending the latter's eastern borders, enabling a German attack to be checked well forward of the French border. The French were dependent on how much cooperation they could extract from the Belgians. Such a situation deprived the French any prepared defences in Belgium to forestall an attack, a situation which the French had wanted to avoid as it meant engaging the German panzer divisions in a mobile battle. 
The French considered invading Belgium immediately in response to a German attack on the country. The Belgians, recognizing the danger posed by the Germans, secretly made their own defense policies, troop movement information, communications, fixed defense dispositions, intelligence and air reconnaissance arrangements available to the French military attaché in Brussels. The Allied plan to aid Belgium was the Dial Plan. The cream of the Allied forces, which included the French armored divisions, would advance to the Dial River in response to a German invasion. The choice of an established Allied line lay in either reinforcing the Belgians in the east of the country, at the Meuse-Albert Canal line, and holding the Scheldt estuary, thus linking the French defences in the south with the Belgian forces protecting Ghent and Antwerp, seemed to be the soundest defensive strategy. The weakness of the plan was that, politically at least, it abandoned most of eastern Belgium to the Germans. Militarily it would put the Allied rear at right angles to the French frontier defences, while for the British, their communications located at the Bay of Biscay ports, would be parallel to their front. Despite the risk of committing forces to central Belgium and an advance to the Scheldt or Dial lines, which would be vulnerable to an outflanking move, Maurice Gamelin, the French commander, approved the plan and it remained the Allied strategy upon the outbreak of war. The British, with no army in the field and behind in rearmament, was in no position to challenge French strategy, which had assumed the prominent role of the Western Alliance. Having little ability to oppose the French, the British strategy for military action came in the form of strategic bombing of the Ruhr industry. <inaudible> Belgian military strategy Upon the official Belgian withdrawal from the Western Alliance, the Belgians refused to engage in any official staff meetings with the French or British military staff for fear of compromising its neutrality. The Belgians did not regard a German invasion as inevitable and were determined that if an invasion did take place it would be effectively resisted by new fortifications such as Eben Emael. The Belgians had taken measures to reconstruct their defences along the border with the German state upon Adolf Hitler's rise to power in January 1933. The Belgian government had watched with increasing alarm the German withdrawal from the League of Nations, its repudiation of the Treaty of Versailles and its violation of the Locarno Treaties. The government increased expenditure on modernizing the fortifications at Namur and Liege. New lines of defense were established along the maastricht bois le duc Canal, joining the Meuse, Scheldt and the Albert Canal. The protection of the eastern frontier, based mainly on the destruction of a number of roads, was entrusted to new formations frontier cyclist units and the newly formed Chasseur Ardennes. By 1935, the Belgian defenses had been completed. Even so, it was felt that the defences were no longer adequate. A significant mobile reserve was needed to guard the rear areas, and as a result it was considered that the protection against a sudden assault by German forces was not sufficient. Significant manpower reserves were also needed, but a bill made for the provision of longer military service and training for the army was rejected by the public on the basis that it would increase Belgium's military commitments as well as the request of the Allies to engage in conflicts far from home. King Leopold III made a speech on 14 October 1936 in front of the Council of Ministers, in an attempt to persuade the people and its government that the defences needed strengthening. He outlined three main military points for Belgium's increased rearmament. A German rearmament, following upon the complete remilitarization of Italy and Russia the Soviet Union, caused most other states, even those that were deliberately pacifistic, like Switzerland and the Netherlands, to take exceptional precautions. B. There has been such a vast change in the methods of warfare as a result of technical progress, particularly in aviation and mechanization, that the initial operations of armed conflict could now be of such force, speed and magnitude as to be particularly alarming to small countries like Belgium. C. Our anxieties have been increased by the lightning reoccupation of the Rhineland and the fact that bases for the start of a possible German invasion have been moved near to our frontier. On 24 April 1937, the French and British delivered a public declaration that Belgium's security was paramount to the Western Allies and that they would defend their frontiers accordingly against aggression of any sort, whether this aggression was directed solely at Belgium, or as a means of obtaining bases from which to wage war against other states. The British and French, under those circumstances, released Belgium from her Locarno obligations to render mutual assistance in the event of German aggression toward Poland, while the British and French maintained their military obligations to Belgium. Militarily, the Belgians considered the Wehrmacht to be stronger than the Allies, particularly the British Army and engaging in overtures to the Allies would result in Belgium becoming a battleground without adequate allies. 
The Belgians and French remained confused about what was expected of each other if or when, hostilities commenced. The Belgians were determined to hold the border fortifications along the Albert Canal and the Meuse, without withdrawing, until the French army arrived to support them. Gamelin was not keen on pushing his dial plan that far. He was concerned that the Belgians would be driven out of their defences and would retreat to Antwerp, as in 1914. In fact, the Belgian divisions protecting the border were to withdraw and retreat southward to link up with French forces. This information was not given to Gamelin. As far as the Belgians were concerned, the Dial Plan had advantages. Instead of the limited Allied advance to the Scheldt, or meeting the Germans on the Franco-Belgian border, the move to the Dial River would reduce the Allied front in central Belgium by 70 kilometres 43 miles, freeing more forces for use as a strategic reserve. It was felt it would save more Belgian territory, in particular the eastern industrial regions. It also had the advantage of absorbing Dutch and Belgian army formations including some 20 Belgian divisions. Gamelin was to justify the Dial Plan after the defeat using these arguments. On 10 January 1940, in an episode known as the Mechelen Incident, a German Army Major Helmuth Rheinberger crash landed in a Messerschmitt Bf 108 near Mechelen on Damas. Rheinberger was carrying the first plans for the German invasion of Western Europe which, as Gamelin had expected, entailed a repeat of the 1914 Schlieffen Plan and a German thrust through the Belgium which was expanded by the Wehrmacht to include the Netherlands and into France. The Belgians suspected a ruse, but the plans were taken seriously. Belgian intelligence and the military attaché in Cologne correctly suggested the Germans would not commence the invasion with this plan. It suggested that the Germans would try an attack through the Belgian Ardennes and advance to Calais with the aim of encircling the Allied armies in Belgium. The Belgians had correctly predicted the Germans would attempt a Kesselschlacht literally, cauldron battle, meaning encirclement, to destroy its enemies. The Belgians had predicted the exact German plan as offered by Erich von Manstein. The Belgian High Command warned the French and British of their concerns. They feared that the Dial Plan would put not just the Belgian strategic position in danger, but also the entire left wing of the Allied front. King Leopold and General Raoul van Overstraden, the King's aide-de-camp, warned Gamelin and the French Army Command of their concerns on 8 March and 14 the April. They were ignored. <laughs> Belgian plans for defensive operations The Belgian plan, in the event of German aggression italics in original, provided for a, a delaying position along the Albert Canal from Antwerp to Liege and the Meuse from Liege to Namur, which was to be held long enough to allow French and British troops to occupy the line antwerp namur Givet. It was anticipated that the forces of the guarantor powers would be in action on the third day of an invasion, b withdrawal to the antwerp namur position. C. The Belgian army was to hold the sector excluding Leuven, but including Antwerp as part of the main Allied defensive position. In an agreement with the British and French armies, the French 7th Army under the command of Henri Giraud was to advance into Belgium, past the Scheldt estuary in Zeeland if possible, to Breda, in the Netherlands. The British Army's British Expeditionary Force or BEF, commanded by General John Verrecker, Lord Gort, was to occupy the central position in the Brussels-Ghent Gap supporting the Belgian Army holding the main defensive positions some 20 kilometres 12 miles east of Brussels. The main defensive position ringing Antwerp would be protected by the Belgians, barely 10 kilometres 6.2 miles from the city. The French 7th Army was to reach the Zeeland or Breda, just inside the Dutch border. The French would then be in a position to protect the left flank of the Belgian army forces protecting Antwerp and threaten the German northern flank. Further east, delaying positions were constructed in the immediate tactical zones along the Albert Canal, which joined with the defences of the Meuse west of Maastricht. The line deviated southward, and continued to Liege. The maastricht liege gap was heavily protected. Fort Eben Mil guarded the city's northern flank, the tank country lying in the strategic depths of the Belgian forces occupying the city and the axis of advance into the west of the country. Further lines of defence ran southwest, covering the Liege Namur axis. The Belgian army also had the added benefit of the French First Army, advancing toward Gembleu and Hannet, on the southern flank of the BEF and covering the Sambre sector. This covered the gap in the Belgian defences between the main Belgian positions on the Dial Line with Namur to the south. Further south still, the French 9th Army advanced to the Givet-Tenant axis on the Meuse River. 
The French Second Army was responsible for the last 100 kilometers, 62 miles of front covering Sedan, the Lower Meuse, the Belgian Luxembourg border and the northern flank of the Maginot Line. Topic: <laughs> German operational plans. The German plan of attack required that Army Group B would advance and draw in the Allied First Army Group into central Belgium, while Army Group A conducted the surprise assault through the Ardennes. Belgium was to act as a secondary front with regard to importance. Army Group B was given only limited numbers of armoured and mobile units while the vast majority of the Army Group comprised infantry divisions. After the English Channel was reached, all Panzer Division units and most motorized infantry were removed from Army Group B and given to Army Group A to strengthen the German lines of communication and to prevent an Allied breakout. Such a plan would still fail if sufficient ground could not be taken quickly in Belgium to squeeze the Allies against two fronts. Preventing this from happening were the defenses of Fort Eben Mil and the Albert Canal. The three bridges over the canal were the key to allowing Army Group B a high operational tempo. The bridges at Veldwezet, Vroinhoven and Kane in Belgium and Maastricht on the Dutch border were the target. Failure to capture the bridges would leave Reichenau's German 6th Army, the southernmost army of Group B, trapped in the Maastricht-Albert Canal enclave and subjected to the fire of Eben Emael. The fort had to be captured or destroyed. Adolf Hitler summoned Lieutenant General Kurt Student of the 7th Flieger Division, 7th Air Division to discuss the assault. It was first suggested that a conventional parachute drop be made by airborne forces to seize and destroy the fort's guns before the land units approached. Such a suggestion was rejected as the Junkers Ju-52 transports were too slow and were likely to be vulnerable to Dutch and Belgian anti-aircraft guns. Other factors for its refusal were the weather conditions, which might blow the paratroopers away from the fort and disperse them too widely. A seven-second drop from a Ju-52 at minimum operational height led to a dispersion over 300 meters alone. Hitler had noticed one potential flaw in the defenses. The roofs were flat and unprotected. He demanded to know if a glider, such as the DFS-230, could land on them. Student replied that it could be done but only by 12 aircraft and in daylight. This would deliver 80 to 90 paratroopers onto the target. Hitler then revealed the tactical weapon that would make this strategic operation work, introducing the Holodungwaffe hollow charge, a 50 kg explosive weapon which would destroy the Belgian gun emplacements. It was this tactical unit that would spearhead the first strategic airborne operation in history. <laughs> Forces involved <laughs> <laughs> Belgian forces. The Belgian army could muster 22 divisions, which contained 1,338 artillery pieces but just 10 AMC-35 tanks. However, the Belgian combat vehicles included 200 T-13 tank destroyers. These had an excellent 47mm anti-tank gun and a coaxial FN-30 machine gun in a turret. The Belgians also possessed 42 T-15s. They were officially described as armoured cars but were actually fully tracked tanks with a 13.2 mm turret machine gun. The standard Belgian anti-tank gun was the 47 mm FRC, towed either by trucks or by fully tracked armoured utility B tractors. One report states that a round from a 47 mm gun went straight through a SDKFZ-231 and penetrated the armour of the Panzer IV behind it. These Belgian guns were better than the 25mm and 37mm guns of respectively the French and the Germans. The Belgians began mobilization on the 25th of August 1939 and by May 1940 mounted a field army of 18 infantry divisions, two divisions of partly motorized chasseur Ardennes and two motorized cavalry divisions, a force totaling some 600,000 men. Belgian reserves may have been able to field 900,000 men. The army lacked armor and anti-aircraft guns. After the completion of the Belgian army's mobilization, it could muster five regular corps and two reserve army corps consisting of 12 regular infantry divisions, two divisions of chasseur Ardennes, six reserve infantry divisions, one brigade of cyclist frontier guards, one cavalry corps of two divisions, and one brigade of motorized cavalry. The army contained two anti-aircraft artillery and four artillery regiments, and an unknown number of fortress, engineer, and signals force personnel. The Belgian Naval Corps, Corps de Marine was resurrected in 1939. 
Most of the Belgian merchant fleet, some 100 ships, evaded capture by the Germans. Under the terms of a Belgian Royal Navy agreement, these ships and their 3,350 crewmen were placed under British control for the duration of hostilities. The general headquarters of the Belgian Admiralty was at Ostend under the command of Major Henry de Carpentry. The 1st Naval Division was based at Ostend, while the 2nd and 3rd Divisions were based at Zeebrugge and Antwerp. The Aéronautique Militaire Belgique Belgian Air Force, AME, had barely begun to modernize their aircraft technology. The AME had ordered Brewster Buffalo, Fiat CR.42, and Hawker Hurricane fighters, Coolhoven FK-56 trainers, Ferry Battle and Caproni CA.312 light bombers, and Caproni CA.335 fighter reconnaissance aircraft, but only the Fiats, Hurricanes, and Battles had been delivered. The shortage of modern types meant single-seat versions of the Ferry Fox light bomber were being used as fighters. The AME possessed 250 combat aircraft. At least 90 were fighters, 12 were bombers and 12 were reconnaissance aircraft. Only 50 were of a reasonably modern standard. When liaison and transport aircraft from all services are included, the total strength was 377, however only 118 of these were serviceable on 10 May 1940. Of this number around 78 were fighters and 40 were bombers. The AME was commanded by Paul Hirno, who had received his pilot's license just before the outbreak of World War I, and had risen to the position of commander-in-chief in 1938. Hirno organized the service into three regiments d'aeronautique air regiments, the 1ER with 60 aircraft, the 2EAM with 53 aircraft, and the 3EAM with 79 aircraft. Topic. French forces. The Belgians were afforded substantial support by the French army. The French First Army included General René Prieux's Cavalry Corps. The corps was given the 2nd Light Mechanized Division, 2E Division Légère Mécanique, or 2E DLM, and the 3rd Light Mechanized Division, 3E DLM, which were allocated to defend the Gembleu Gap. The armoured forces consisted of 176 of the formidable SOMUAS 35s and 239 Hotchkiss H 35 light tanks. Both of these types, in armor and firepower, were superior to most German types. The 3 EDLM contained 90 S 35s and some 140 H 35s alone. The French 7th Army was assigned to protect the northernmost part of the Allied front. It contained the 1st Light Mechanized Division, 1 RE DLM, the 25th Motorized Infantry Division, 25E Division d'Infanterie Motorisée, or 25E DIM, and the 9th Motorized Infantry Division, 9E DIM. This force would advance to Breda in the Netherlands. The third French army to see action on Belgian soil was the 9th. It was weaker than both the 7th and the 1st armies. The 9th army was allocated infantry divisions, with the exception of the 5th Motorized Infantry Division, 5E DIM. Its mission was to protect the southern flank of the Allied armies, south of the Sambre River and just north of Sedan. Further south, in France, was the French 2nd Army, protecting the Franco Belgian border between Sedan and Montmédy. The two weakest French armies were thus protecting the area of the main German thrust. Topic. British forces The British contributed the weakest force to Belgium. The BEF, under the command of General Lord Gort VC, consisted of just 152,000 men in two corps of two divisions each. It was hoped to field two armies of two corps each, but this scale of mobilization never took place. The first corps was commanded by LT Gen. John Dill, later LT Gen. Michael Barker, who was in turn replaced by Major General Harold Alexander. LT Gen. Alan Brooke commanded 2nd Corps. Later the 3rd Corps under LT Gen. Ronald Adam was added to the British Order of Battle. A further 9,392 Royal Air Force RAF personnel of the RAF Advanced Air Striking Force under the command of Air Vice Marshal Patrick Playfair was to support operations in Belgium. By May 1940 the BEF had grown to 394,165 men, of whom more than 150,000 were part of the logistical rear area organizations and had little military training. On 10 May 1940, the BEF comprised just 10 divisions not all at full strength, 1,280 artillery pieces and 310 tanks. <laughs> German forces 
Army Group B was commanded by Fedor von Bock. It was allocated 26 infantry and three panzer divisions for the invasion of the Netherlands and Belgium. Of the three panzer divisions, the 3rd and 4th were to operate in Belgium under the command of the 6th Army's 16th Corps. The 9th Panzer Division was attached to the 18th Army which, after the Battle of the Netherlands, would support the push into Belgium alongside the 18th Army and cover its northern flank. Armor strength in Army Group B amounted to 808 tanks, of which 282 were Panzer As, 288 were Panzer IIs, 123 were Panzer IIIs and 66 were Panzer Fas, 49 command tanks were also operational. The 3rd Panzer Division's armored regiments consisted of 117 Panzer As, 128 Panzer IIs, 42 Panzer IIIs, 26 Panzer Fas and 27 command tanks. The 4th Panzer Division had 136 Panzer As, 105 Panzer IIs, 40 Panzer IIIs, 24 Panzer Fas and 10 command tanks. The 9th Panzer, scheduled initially for operations in the Netherlands, was the weakest division with only 30 Panzer As, 54 Panzer IIs, 41 Panzer IIIs, 16 Panzer Fas and 12 command tanks. The elements drawn from the 7th Air Division and the 22nd Air Landing Division, that were to take part in the attack on Fort Eben Emael, were named Sturmabteilung Koch Assault Detachment Koch, named after the commanding officer of the group, Hauptmann Walter Koch. The force was assembled in November 1939. It was primarily composed of parachutists from the 1st Parachute Regiment and engineers from the 7th Air Division, as well as a small group of Luftwaffe pilots. The Luftwaffe allocated 1,815 combat, 487 transport aircraft and 50 gliders for the assault on the Low Countries. The initial air strikes over Belgian air space were to be conducted by IV. Fliegerkorps under General der Flieger Generaloberst Alfred Keller. Keller's force consisted of Lehrgeschwader 1 Stab. I, 2, 3, IV, Kampfgeschwader 30 Stab. I, 2, 3, and Kampfgeschwader 27 3. On 10 May Keller had 363 aircraft 224 serviceable augmented by General Mahor Wolfram von Richthofen's 8. Fliegerkorps with 550 420 serviceable aircraft. They in turn were supported by Oberst Kurt Bertram von Doring's Jagdfliegerführer 2, with 462 fighters 313 serviceable, Keller's IV. Fliegerkorps headquarters would operate from Dusseldorf, LG-1. Kampfgeschwader 30 which was based at Oldenburg and its three. Group were based at Marx. Support for Doring and von Richthofen came from present-day North Rhine-Westphalia and bases in Grevenbroich, Mönchengladbach, Dortmund and Essen. Topic. Battle Topic. Luftwaffe operations, 10 May During the evening of 9 May, the Belgian military attaché in Berlin intimated that the Germans intended to attack the following day. Offensive movement of enemy forces were detected on the border. At 010 on 10 May 1940, at General Headquarters an unspecified squadron in Brussels gave the alarm. A full state of alert was instigated at 1.30 am. Belgian forces took up their deployment positions. The Allied armies had enacted their dial plan on the morning of 10 May, and were approaching the Belgian rear. King Leopold had gone to his headquarters near Bregen, Antwerp. The Luftwaffe was to spearhead the aerial battle in the Low Countries. Its first task was the elimination of the Belgian air contingent. Despite an overwhelming numerical superiority of 1,375 aircraft, 957 of which were serviceable, the air campaign in Belgium had limited success overall on the first day. At roughly 4 o'clock, the first air raids were conducted against airfields and communication centers. It still had a tremendous impact on the AME, which had only 179 aircraft on 10 May. Much of the success achieved was down to Richthofen's subordinates, particularly Kampfgeschwader 77 and its commander Oberst Dr. Johann Volkmer Fisser whose attachment to 8. Fliegerkorps, was noted by General Mahor Wilhelm Speidel. He commented that it was the result of the well-known tendency of the commanding general to conduct his own private war. Fisser's KG-77 destroyed the AME main bases, with help from KG-54. 
Fighters from Jajdeshwader 27, JG 27 eliminated two Belgian squadrons at Nierhespen, and during the afternoon, I. St. G2 destroyed nine of the 15 Fiat CR.42 fighters at Brustham. At Schaffen Diest, three Hawker Hurricanes of Escadrille 2, I. 2 were destroyed and another six damaged when a wave of He-111s caught them as they were about to take off. A further two were lost in destroyed hangars. At Nivelles Airfield, 13 CR 42s were destroyed. The only other success was KG 27's destruction of eight aircraft at Belessel. In aerial combat, the battles were also one sided. Two He 111s, two Du 17s, and three Messerschmitt Bf 109s were shot down by Gloucester Gladiators and Hurricanes. In return, eight Belgian gladiators, five Ferry Foxes and one County Route 42 were shot down by JG-1, 21 and 27. No. 18 Squadron RAF sent two Bristol Blenheims on operations over the Belgian front, but lost both to BF 109s. By the end of 10 May, the official German figures indicate claims for 30 Belgian aircraft destroyed on the ground, and 14 plus the two RAF bombers in the air for 10 losses. The victory claims are likely an undercount. A total of 83 Belgian machines mostly trainers and squadron hacks were destroyed. The AME flew only 146 sorties in the first six days. Between 16 May and 28 May, the AME flew just 77 operations. It spent most of its time in fuel withdrawing in the face of Luftwaffe attacks. 10–11 May, the border battles The German planners had recognized the need to eliminate Fort Eben Emael if their army was to break into the interior of Belgium. It decided to deploy airborne forces to land inside the fortress perimeter using gliders, using special explosives and flamethrowers to disable the defenses. The Fallschirmjäger then entered the fortress. In the ensuing battle, German infantry overcame the defenders of the I Belgian Corps 7th Infantry Division in 24 hours. The main Belgian defence line had been breached and German infantry of the 18th Army had passed through it rapidly. Moreover, German soldiers had established bridgeheads across the Albert Canal before the British were able to reach it some 48 hours later. The Chasseur Ardennes further south, on the orders of their commander, withdrew behind the Meuse, destroying some bridges in their wake. The German airborne forces were assisted by Junkers Ju 87 Stukas of 3, Sturzkampfgeschwader 2 STG2 and I, Sturzkampfgeschwader 77 STG77 helped suppress the defences. Henschel H's 123s of 2, S, Lergeschwader 2 LG2 which assisted in the capture of the bridges at Vreunhoven and Veldweset in the immediate area. Further successful German airborne offensive operations were carried out in Luxembourg which seized five crossings and communication routes leading into central Belgium. The offensive, carried out by 125 volunteers of the 34th Infantry Division under the command of Wenner Hedrick, achieved their missions by flying to their objectives using Fieseler Phi 156 Storch. The cost was the loss of five aircraft and 30 dead. With the fort breached, the Belgian 4th and 7th Infantry Divisions were confronted by the prospect of fighting an enemy on relatively sound terrain for armor operations. The 7th Division, with its 2nd and 18th Grenadier Regiments and 2nd Carabiniers, struggled to hold their positions and contain the German infantry on the West Bank. The Belgian tactical units engaged in several counterattacks. At one point, at Briegden, they succeeded in retaking the bridge and blowing it up. At the other points, Vreunhoven and Veldweset, the Germans had had time to establish strong bridgeheads and repulsed the attacks. A little-known third airborne operation, Operation Nevi, was also conducted on 10 May in southern Belgium. The objectives of this operation was to land two companies of the 3rd Battalion Grossdeutschland Infantry Regiment by Phi-156 aircraft at Knives and Wittry in the south of the country, in order to clear a path for the 1st and 2nd Panzer Divisions which were advancing through the Belgian Luxembourg Ardennes. The original plan called for the use of Junkers Ju-52 transport aircraft, but the short landing capability of the Phi-156 saw 200 of these aircraft used in the assault. The operational mission was to 1. Cut signal communications and message links on the Neufchâteau Bastogne and Neufchâteau Martelange roads. Neufchâteau being the largest southernmost city in Belgium. 2. Prevent the approach of reserves from the Neufchâteau area. 3. 
Facilitate the capture of pillboxes and the advance by exerting pressure against the line of pillboxes along the border from the rear. The German infantry were engaged by several Belgian patrols equipped with T-15 armoured cars. Several Belgian counterattacks were repulsed, among them an attack by the 1st Light Chasseur Ardennes Division. Unsupported, the Germans faced a counterattack later in the evening by elements of the French 5th Cavalry Division, dispatched by General Charles Hunziger from the French 2nd Army, which had massive tank strength. The Germans were forced to retreat. The French, however, failed to pursue the fleeing German units, stopping at a dummy barrier. By the next morning, the 2nd Panzer Division had reached the area, and the mission had largely been accomplished. From the German perspective, the operation hindered rather than helped Heinz Guderian's Panzer Corps. The regiment had blocked the roads and, against the odds, prevented French reinforcements reaching the Belgian-Franco-Luxembourg border, but it also destroyed Belgian telephone communications. This inadvertently prevented the Belgian Field Command recalling the units along the border. The 1st Belgian Light Infantry did not receive the signal to retreat and engaged in a severe fire fight with the German armour, slowing down their advance. The failure of the Franco Belgian forces to hold the Ardennes Gap was fatal. The Belgians had withdrawn laterally upon the initial invasion and had demolished and blocked routes of advance, which held up the French 2nd Army units moving north toward Namur and Hoy. Devoid of any centre of resistance, the German assault engineers had cleared the obstacles unchallenged. The delay that the Belgian Ardennes Light Infantry, considered to be an elite formation, could have inflicted upon the advancing German armour was proved by the fight for Bodange, where the 1st Panzer Division was held up for a total of eight hours. This battle was a result of a breakdown in communications and ran contrary to the operational intentions of the Belgian army. Meanwhile, in the central Belgian sector, having failed to restore their front by means of ground attack, the Belgians attempted to bomb the bridges and positions that the Germans had captured intact and were holding on of May. Belgian ferry battles of 5-3-3 escorted by six Gloucester gladiators attacked the Albert Canal bridges. BF 109s from I. Jagdgeschwader 1 JG1 and I. JG27 intercepted and JG1 shot down four gladiators and both units destroyed six battles and heavily damaged the remaining three. Eight CR 42s were evacuated from Brustum to Grimbergen near Brussels, but seven gladiators and the last remaining hurricanes from two I. Two escadrille were destroyed at Bovachain Air Base and Le Coulot by He 111s and I. JG27 respectively. The RAF contributed to the effort to attack the bridges. The British dispatched Bristol Blenheims from 110 and 21 Squadron. The first squadron lost two, one to I, JG 27. 21 Squadron suffered damage to most of the bombers because of intense ground fire. The French Armée de l'Air dispatched Leo 451s from GBI, 12 and GBII, 12 escorted by 18 Moraine Saulnier MS 406 of GCIII, 3 and GCII, 6. The operation failed and one bomber was lost while four MS 406s fell to IJG-1. The French claimed five. Meanwhile, 114 squadron lost six Blenheims destroyed when Dornier du 17s of Kampfgeschwader II bombed their airfield at Vreux. Another battle of No. 150 Squadron RAF was lost in another raid. The German counter air operations were spearheaded by Jagdgeschwader 26, JG 26 under the command of Hans Hugo Witt, which was responsible for 82 of the German claims in aerial combat between 11 and 13 May. Despite the apparent success of the German fighter units, the air battle was not one-sided. On the morning of of May 10 Ju 87s of STG-2 were shot down attacking Belgian forces in the namur denant gap, despite the presence of two Jagdgeschwader—27 and 51. Nevertheless, the Germans reported a weakening in Allied air resistance in northern Belgium by 13 May. During the night of the 11th of May, the British 3rd Infantry Division under the command of General Bernard La Montgomery, reached its position on the Dial River at Leuven. As it did so the Belgian 10th Infantry Division, occupying the position, mistook them for German parachutists and fired on them. The Belgians refused to yield but Montgomery claimed to have got his way by placing himself under the command of the Belgian forces, knowing that when the Germans came within artillery range the Belgians would withdraw. Alan Brook, commander of the British Second Corps sought to put the matter of cooperation right with King Leopold. The King discussed the matter with Brook, who felt a compromise could be reached. 
Van Overstraten, the King's military aide, stepped in and said that the 10th Belgian Infantry Division could not be moved. Instead, the British should move further south and remain completely clear of Brussels. Brooke told the King that the 10th Belgian Division was on the wrong side of the Gamelin line and was exposed. Leopold deferred to his advisor and chief of staff. Brooke found Overstaden to be ignorant of the situation and the dispositions of the BEF. Given that the left flank of the BEF rested on its Belgian ally, the British were now unsure about Belgian military capabilities. The Allies had more serious grounds for complaint about the Belgian anti-tank defences along the Dial Line, that covered the namur perway gap which was not protected by any natural obstacles. Only a few days before the attack, General Headquarters had discovered the Belgians had sighted their anti-tank defences defenses several miles east of the Dial between namur perway After holding onto the Albert Canal's west bank for nearly 36 hours, the 4th and 7th Belgian Infantry Divisions withdrew. The capture of Eben Emael allowed the Germans to force through the panzers of the 6th Army. The situation for the Belgian divisions was either to withdraw or be encircled. The Germans had advanced beyond Tongeren and were now in a position to sweep south to Namur, which would threaten to envelop the entire Albert Canal and Liege positions. Under the circumstances, both divisions withdrew. On the evening of of May, the Belgian command withdrew its forces behind the Namur-Antwerp line. The following day, the French First Army arrived at Gemblou, between Wave and Namur, to cover the Gemblou Gap. It was a flat area, devoid of prepared or entrenched positions. The French Seventh Army, on the northern flank of the Belgian line, protected the Bruges Ghent Ostend axis and, covering the Channel ports, had advanced into Belgium and into the Netherlands with speed. It reached Breda in the Netherlands, on the 11th of May. But German parachute forces had seized the Mordic Bridge on the Hollands Deep River, south of Rotterdam, making it impossible for the French to link up with the Dutch army. The Dutch army withdrew north to Rotterdam and Amsterdam. The French 7th Army turned east and met the 9th Panzer Division about 20 kilometers 12 miles east of Breda at Tilburg. The battle resulted in the French retiring, in the face of Luftwaffe air assaults, to Antwerp. It would later help in the defense of the city. The Luftwaffe had given priority to attacking the French 7th Army's spearhead into the Netherlands as it threatened the Mordic bridgehead. Kampfgeschwader 40 and 54 supported by Ju 87s from 8. Fliegerkorps helped drive them back. Fears of Allied reinforcements reaching Antwerp forced the Luftwaffe to cover the Scheldt estuary. KG-30 bombed and sank two Dutch gunboats and three Dutch destroyers, as well as badly damaging two Royal Navy destroyers but overall the bombing had a limited effect. Following the arrival of Gamelin's military envoy, General Champon the, 10th of May, the Belgian government's strategy became, to conform with the French strategy. This affirmed the Dial Plan, concentrating Belgian forces in the centre of Belgium, by withdrawing behind the KW line, extending from Antwerp to Wave. French forces would cover two obvious gaps, one, between Wave and Namur, known as the Gemblou Gap and another centered on Dinant, from the French border to the city of Namur. The gap was an unfortified, untrenched space in the main Belgian defensive line. Stretched from the southern end of the Dial Line, from Wave in the north, to Namur in the south, 20 km 12 miles to 30 km 19 miles. During the night of 11-12 May, the Belgians were fully engaged in withdrawing to the Dial Line, covered by a network of demolitions and rearguards astride Tongeren. During the morning of 12 May, King Leopold III, General van Overstraten, Eduard Daladier, General Alphonse Georges commander of the 1st Allied Army Group, comprising the BEF, French 1st, 2nd, 7th and 9th Armies, General Gaston Billot coordinator of the Allied Armies and General Henry Royds Pownel, Gort's Chief of Staff, met for a military conference near Mons. It was agreed the Belgian army would man the Antwerp Leuven line, while its allies took up the responsibility of defending the extreme north and south of the country. The Belgian 3rd Corps, and its 1st Chasseur Ardennes, 2nd Infantry, and 3rd Infantry divisions had withdrawn from the Liege Fortified Position PFL to avoid being encircled. One regiment, the Liege Fortress Regiment, stayed behind to disrupt German communications. 
Further to the south, the Namur Fortified Position PFN, manned by V Corps 5th Infantry Division and the 2nd Chasseur Ardennes with the 12th French Infantry Division, fought delaying actions and participated in a lot of demolition work while guarding the position. As far as the Belgians were concerned, it had accomplished the only independent mission assigned to it to hold the Liege Albert Canal line long enough for the Allied units to reach friendly forces occupying the Namur Antwerp Givet line. For the remainder of the campaign, the Belgians would execute their operations in accordance with the overall Allied plan. Topic: <inaudible> Eastern Belgium, 12 to 13 May. As units already on the dial line worked tirelessly to organize better defensive positions in the Leuven-Antwerp gap, other Belgian soldiers fought rearguard actions. The 2nd Regiment of Guides and the 2nd Carabiniers Cyclists of the 2nd Belgian Cavalry Division covered the retreat of the 4th and 7th Belgian Divisions and were particularly distinguished at Tienen Turlmont, and Halen. In support of Belgian forces in the area, the RAF and French flew air defence operations over Tienen and Leuven. Louvain. The RAF Advanced Air Striking Force committed 3, 504, 79, 57, 59, 85, 87, 605, and 242 squadrons to battle. A series of air battles were fought with JG-1, 2, 26, 27 and 3. Messerschmitt Bf 110s from Zerstorgeschwader 26, ZG 26, and bomber units LG-1, 2 and KG-27 were also involved. Over Belgium and France, the day was disastrous for the British, 27 hurricanes were shot down. On 12 May, as the German Army Group A advanced westward out of the Belgian Ardennes, Army Group B's 6th Army launched offensive thrusts towards Brussels. To the Allies, the Belgian failure to hold onto its eastern frontiers was a disappointment as they were thought to be capable of holding out for two weeks. The Allied Chiefs of Staff had sought to avoid an encounter-mobile battle without any strong fixed defences to fall back on and hoped Belgian resistance would last long enough for a defensive line to be established. Nevertheless, a brief lull fell on the dial front on of May which enabled the Allied armies to get into position by the time the first major assault was launched the following day. Allied cavalry had moved into position and infantry and artillery were reaching the front more slowly, by rail. Although they were unaware of it, the 1st Allied Army Group and the Belgian Army outnumbered and outgunned Walther von Reichenau's German 6th Army. On the morning of 12 May, in response to Belgian pressure and necessity, the Royal Air Force and the Armée de l'Air undertook several air attacks on the German-held Maastricht and Meuse bridges to prevent German forces flowing into Belgium. 74 sorties had been flown by the Allies since 10 May. On 12 May, 11 out of 18 French Brigade 693 bombers were shot down. The RAF Advanced Air Striking Force, which included the largest Allied bomber force, was reduced to 72 aircraft out of 135 by 12 May. For the next 24 hours, missions were postponed as the German anti-aircraft and fighter defences were too strong. The results of the bombing are difficult to determine. The German 19th Corps War Diaries Situation Summary at 2000 on 14 May noted, the completion of the military bridge at Donchery had not yet been carried out owing to heavy flanking artillery fire and long bombing attacks on the bridging point. Throughout the day all three divisions have had to endure constant air attack, especially at the crossing and bridging points. Our fighter cover is inadequate. Requests for increased fighter protection are still unsuccessful. The Luftwaffe's operations includes a note of vigorous enemy fighter activity through which our close reconnaissance in particular is severely impeded." Nevertheless, inadequate protection was given to cover RAF bombers against the strength of German opposition over the target area. In all, out of 109 ferry battles and Bristol Blenheims which had attacked enemy columns and communications in the Sedan area, 45 had been lost. On 15 May, daylight bombing was significantly reduced. Of 23 aircraft employed, four failed to return. Equally, owing to the Allied fighter presence, the German 19th Corps War Diary states, Corps no longer has at its disposal its own long-range reconnaissance. Reconnaissance squadrons are no longer in a position to carry out vigorous, extensive reconnaissance, as, owing to casualties, more than half of their aircraft are not now available. 
On 13 May, in light of the withdrawal to the main defensive line, which was now being supported by the British and French armies, King Leopold issued the following proclamation to improve morale after the defeats at the Albert Canal. Soldiers the Belgian army, brutally assailed by an unparalleled surprise attack, grappling with forces that are better equipped and have the advantage of a formidable air force, has for three days carried out difficult operations, the success of which is of the utmost importance to the general conduct of the battle and to the result of war. These operations require from all of us, officers and men, exceptional efforts, sustained day and night, despite a moral tension tested to its limits by the sight of the devastation wrought by a pitiless invader. However severe the trial may be, you will come through it gallantly. Our position improves with every hour, our ranks are closing up. In the critical days that are ahead of us, you will summon up all your energies, you will make every sacrifice, to stem the invasion. Just as they did in 1914 on the YSER, so now the French and British troops are counting on you, the safety and honour of the country are in your hands. Leopold Southern Belgium 12 May. Hannet The French expected a major German thrust or thrusts to converge on the Gemblou Gap. This corridor was now the responsibility of the French 1st Army, with six elite divisions including the 2nd 2E Division Légère Mécanique, or 2EDLM and 3rd Light Mechanized Divisions. The French Cavalry Corps, under the command of René Priou, was to advance 30 kilometres 19 miles beyond the line east to provide a screen for the move. The French 1st and 2nd Armoured Divisions were to be moved behind the French 1st Army to defend its main lines in depth. The Cavalry Corps was equal to a German Panzer Corps and was to occupy a screening line on the tourmont hannet hoy axis. The operational plan called for the Corps to delay the German advance on Gembleu and Hannet until the main elements of the French 1st Army had reached Gembleu and dug in. On 12 May, Erich Hoepner's 16 Panzer Corps, which had previously attacked out of the Maastricht bulge and defeated the Belgian defences at Liege, compelling the Belgian 1st Corps to retreat, launched an offensive at Hannet. The 3rd and 4th Panzer Divisions and Prius Corps clashed head-on, on 12 May. Contrary to popular belief, the Germans did not outnumber the French. Frequently, figures of 623 German and 415 French tanks are given. In fact, the German 3rd and 4th Panzer Divisions numbered 280 and 343 tanks respectively. The 2 EDLM and 3 EDLM numbered 176 Samuis and 239 Hotchkiss H 35s. Added to this force were the considerable number of Renault Amur ZT 63s in the Cavalry Corps. The R 35 was equal or superior to the Panzer I and Panzer IIs in armament terms. This applies all the more to the 90 Panard 178 armoured cars of the French Army. Its 25mm main gun could penetrate the armor of the Panzer IV. In terms of tanks that were capable of engaging and surviving a tank versus tank action, the Germans possessed just 73 Panzer III's and 52 Panzer IVs. The French had 176 SOMUA and 239 Hotchkisses. German tank units also contained 486 Panzer I and IIs, which were of dubious combat value given their losses in the Polish campaign. The German forces were able to communicate by radio during the battle and they could shift the point of the main effort unexpectedly. The Germans also practiced combined arms tactics, while the French tactical deployment was a rigid and linear leftover from the First World War. French tanks did not possess radios and often the commanders had to dismount to issue orders. Despite the disadvantages experienced by the Germans in armor, they were able to gain the upper hand in the morning battle on 12 May, encircling several French battalions. The combat power of the French 2 EDLM managed to defeat the German defenses guarding the pockets and freeing the trapped units. Contrary to German reports, the French were victorious on that first day, preventing a Wehrmacht breakthrough to Gembleu or seizing Hannet. The result of the first day's battle was the effect on the German light tanks was catastrophic. Virtually every French weapon from 25mm upward penetrated the 7-13mm of the Panzer I although the Panzer II fared somewhat better, especially those that had been up-armoured since the Polish campaign, their losses were high. Such was the sheer frustration of the crews of these light panzers in the face of heavier armoured French machines that some resorted to desperate expedients. 
One account speaks of a German panzer commander attempting to climb on a Hotchkiss H-35 with a hammer, presumably to smash the machine's periscopes, but falling off and being crushed by the tank's tracks. Certainly by day's end, Priu had reason to claim that his tanks had come off best. The battlefield around Hannet was littered with knocked-out tanks the bulk of which were German panzers with by far and away the bulk of them being panzer as an IIs. The following day, 13 May, the French were undone by their poor tactical deployment. They strung their armor out in a thin line between Hannet and Hoy, leaving no defense in depth, which was the point of sending the French armor to the Gembleu Gap in the first place. This left Hopner with a chance to mass against one of the French light divisions 3 EDLM and achieve a breakthrough in that sector. Moreover, with no reserves behind the front, the French denied themselves the chance of a counterattack. The victory saw the Panzer Corps outmaneuver 2 EDLM on its left flank. The Belgian Third Corps, retreating from Liege, offered to support the French front held by the 3 EDLM. This offer was rejected. 2 EDLM lost no AFVs, but 3 EDLM lost 30 SOMUAs and 75 Hotchkisses. The French had disabled 160 German tanks. But as the poor linear deployment had allowed the Germans the chance of breaking through in one spot, the entire battlefield had to be abandoned. The Germans repaired nearly three quarters of their tanks, 49 were destroyed and 111 were repaired. They had 60 men killed and another 80 wounded. In terms of battlefield casualties, the Hannet battle had resulted in the French knocking out 160 German tanks, losing 105 themselves. Despite the failure by the Germans at Hannet, there was no way to rebuild a continuous Allied front. The French Cavalry Corps had achieved its mission and was withdrawn. <laughs> Dinant Gap German units were also attacking towards Dinant, through the Condras low hills of the province of Namur. Between 12 May and 15 May, Hoth's 15 Panzer Corps attacked the French 2nd and 11th Corps, including many armoured units, along the Dinant Flavian Florence Corridor, in the Battle of Dinant and Battle of Flavian. <laughs> Gembleu Gap Meanwhile Hopner was pursuing Priu's units withdrawing from Hannet toward Gembleu. Being impatient, Hopner did not wait for his infantry divisions to catch up. Instead, he hoped to continue pushing the French back and not give them time to construct a coherent defense line. German formations pursued the enemy to Gembleu. The Panzer Corps ran into retreating French columns and inflicted heavy losses on them. The pursuit created severe problems for the French artillery. The combat was so closely fought that there was an increasing danger of friendly fire incidents. Nevertheless, the French, setting up new anti-tank screens and Hopner, lacking infantry support, caused the Germans to attack positions head-on. Although suffering numerous tactical reverses, operationally the Germans diverted the Allied First Army Group from the Lower Ardennes area. In the process his forces, along with the Luftwaffe depleted Priu Cavalry Corps. When news of the German breakthrough at Sedan reached Priu, he withdrew from Gembleu. With the Gembleu Gap breached, the German Panzer Corps, the 3rd and 4th Panzer Divisions, were no longer required by Army Group B and were handed over to Army Group A. Army Group B would continue its own offensive to force the collapse of the Meuse Front. The Army Group was in a position to advance westward to Mons, outflank the BEF and Belgian Army protecting the Dial Brussels sector, or turn south to outflank the French 9th Army. The German attempts to capture Gembleu on 14–15 May were repulsed. German losses had been heavy at Hannet and Gembleu that the two panzer divisions concerned were forced to slow their pursuit. The 4th Panzer Division was down to 137 tanks on 16 May, including just four panzer FAS. The 3rd Panzer Division was down by 20–25% of its operational force, while the 4th Panzer Division 45–50% of its tanks were not combat ready. Damaged tanks were quickly repaired, but its strength was initially greatly weakened. The French First Army had also taken a battering, and despite winning several tactical defensive victories, it was forced to retreat on the 15th of May, owing to developments elsewhere, leaving its tanks on the battlefield. While the Germans were free to recover theirs in the central Namur area, the French Fifth Corps under René Altmaier withdrew to defend the bridges on the Sambre at Charleroi. Although the Belgian general staff was not informed of this redeployment. Finding itself isolated in the Namur fortified position, the Belgian 7th Corps abandoned it on 15 May. 
On 16 and 17 May Reinhardt's XLI Corps attacked Charlero, but was repulsed by the 5th North African Infantry Division. 15–21 May, counterattacks and retreat to the coast On the morning of 15 May, German Army Group A broke the defences at Sedan and was now free to drive for the English Channel. The Allies considered a wholesale withdrawal from the Belgian trap. The withdrawal would reflect three stages, the night of 16-17 May to the River Seine, the night of 17-18 May to the River Dendra and the night of 18-19 May to the River Scheldt. The Belgians were reluctant to abandon Brussels and Leuven, especially as the Dial Line had withstood German pressure well. The Belgian Army, the BEF and the French First Army, in a domino effect, was ordered, forced to retire on 16 May to avoid their southern flanks from being turned by the German armoured forces advancing through the French Ardennes and the German Sixth Army advancing through Gembleu. The Belgian Army was holding the German 14th Army on the KW Line, along with the French 7th and British armies. Had it not been for the collapse of the French Second Army at Sedan, the Belgians were confident that they could have checked the German advance. The situation called for the French and British to abandon the Antwerp Namur line and strong positions in favour of improvised positions behind the Scheldt, without facing any real resistance. In the south, General Defontaine of the Belgian VII Corps retreated from the Namur and Liege regions. The Liege Fortress region put up stiff resistance to the German VI Army. In the north, the 7th Army was diverted to Antwerp after the surrender of the Dutch on 15 May, but was then diverted to support the French 1st Army. In the centre, the Belgian Army and the BEF suffered little German pressure. On 15 May, the only sector to really be tested was around Leuven, which was held by the British 3rd Division. The BEF was not pursued vigorously to the Scheldt. After the withdrawal of the French Army from the northern sector, the Belgians were left to guard the fortified city of Antwerp. Four infantry divisions including the 13th and 17th Reserve Infantry Divisions engaged the German 18th Army's 208th, 225th and 526th Infantry Divisions. The Belgians successfully defended the northern part of the city, delaying the German infantry forces while starting to withdraw from Antwerp on 16 May. The city fell on 18-19 May after considerable Belgian resistance. On 18 May the Belgians received word that Namur's Fort Marchevelet had fallen, Swarley fell on 19 May, saint airy bert and Malone on 21 May, Dave, Mazaret and Andoy on 23 May. Between 16 and 17 May, the British and French withdrew behind the Willebroek Canal, as the volume of Allied forces in Belgium fell and moved toward the German armoured thrust from the Ardennes. The Belgian 1st Corps and 5th Corps also retreated to what the Belgians called the Ghent Bridgehead, behind the Dendra and Scheldt. The Belgian Artillery Corps and its infantry support defeated attacks by the 18th Army's infantry and in a communique from London, the British recognised the Belgian Army has contributed largely toward the success of the defensive battle now being fought. Nevertheless, the now outnumbered Belgians abandoned Brussels and the government fled to Ostend. The city was occupied by the German army on 17 May. The very next morning, Hopner, the German 16th Corps commander, was ordered to release the 3rd and 4th Panzer Divisions to Army Group A. This left the 9th Panzer Division attached to the 18th Army as the only armoured unit on the Belgian front. By 19 May, the Germans were hours away from reaching the French Channel coast. Gort had discovered the French had neither plan nor reserves and little hope for stopping the German thrust to the Channel. He was concerned that the French 1st Army on its southern flank had been reduced to a disorganized mass of fag ends, fearing that German armor might appear on their right flank at Arras or Peronne, striking for the Channel ports at Calais or Boulogne or northwest into the British flank. Their position in Belgium massively compromised, the BEF considered abandoning Belgium and retreating to Ostend, Bruges or Dunkirk, the latter lying some 10 km miles to 15 km miles inside the French border. The proposals of a British strategic withdrawal from the continent was rejected by the War Cabinet and the Chief of the Imperial General Staff Sigs. They dispatched General Ironside to inform Gord of their decision and to order him to conduct an offensive to the southwest through all opposition, to reach the main French forces. In the south, the strongest French forces were actually in the north. The Belgian army was asked to conform to the plan, or should they choose, the British Royal Navy would evacuate what units they could. The British cabinet decided that even if the 
Somme Offensive was carried out successfully, some units may still need to be evacuated, and ordered Admiral Ramsey to assemble a large number of vessels. This was the beginning of Operation Dynamo. Ironside arrived at British General Headquarters at 6 a.m. on 20 May, the same day that continental communications between France and Belgium was cut. When Ironside made his proposals known to Gort, Gort replied such an attack was impossible. Seven of his nine divisions were engaged on the Scheldt and even if it was possible to withdraw them, it would create a gap between the Belgians and British which the enemy could exploit and encircle the former. The BEF had been marching and fighting for nine days and was now running short of ammunition. The main effort had to be made by the French to the south. The Belgian position on any offensive move was made clear by Leopold III. As far as he was concerned, the Belgian army could not conduct offensive operations as it lacked tanks and aircraft, it existed solely for defence. The king also made clear that in the rapidly shrinking area of Belgium still free, there was only enough food for two weeks. Leopold did not expect the BEF to jeopardise its own position in order to keep contact with the Belgian army, but he warned the British that if it persisted with the southern offensive the Belgians would be overstretched and their army would collapse. King Leopold suggested the best recourse was to establish a beachhead covering Dunkirk and the Belgian Channel ports. The will of the SIGs won out. Gort committed just two infantry battalions and the only armoured battalion in the BEF to the attack, which despite some initial tactical success, failed to break the German defensive line at the Battle of Arras on 21 May in the aftermath of this failure, the Belgians were asked to fall back to the Yser River and protect the Allied left flank and rear areas. The King's aide, General Overstraten said that such a move could not be made and would lead to the Belgian army disintegrating. Another plan for further offensives was suggested. The French requested the Belgians withdraw to the Leia and the British to the French frontier between Maulda and Halluin. The Belgians were then to extend their front to free further parts of the BEF for the attack. The French First Army would relieve two more divisions on the right flank. Leopold was reluctant to undertake such a move because it would abandon all but a small portion of Belgium. The Belgian army was exhausted and it was an enormous technical task that would take too long to complete. At this time, the Belgians and the British concluded that the French were beaten and the Allied armies in the pocket on the Belgian Franco border would be destroyed if action was not taken. The British, having lost confidence in their allies, decided to look to the survival of the BEF. Topic. 22–28 May, last defensive battles The Belgian battle front on the morning of of May extended some 90 kilometres from north to south, beginning with the Cavalry Corps, which checked its advance at Ternusen. V, 2, V, 7th and 4th Corps all Belgian were drawn up side by side. Two further Signal Corps were guarding the coast. These formations were then largely holding the Eastern Front as the BEF and French forces withdrew to the west to protect Dunkirk, which was vulnerable to German assault on of May. The Eastern Front remained intact, but the Belgians now occupied their last fortified position at Leia. The Belgian First Corps, with only two incomplete divisions, had been heavily engaged in the fighting and their line was wearing thin. On that day, Winston Churchill visited the front and pressed for the French and British armies to break out from the northeast. He assumed that the Belgian Cavalry Corps could support the offensive's right flank. Churchill dispatched the following message to Gort. 1. That the Belgian army should withdraw to the line of the YSER and stand there, the sluices being opened. 2. That the British Army and French First Army should attack southwest toward Bapaume and Cambrai at the earliest moment, certainly tomorrow, with about eight divisions, and with the Belgian Cavalry Corps on the right of the British. Such an order ignored the fact that the Belgian army could not withdraw to the YSER, and there was little chance of any Belgian cavalry joining in the attack. The plan for the Belgian withdrawal was sound, the YSER river covered Dunkirk to the east and south, while the La Basse Canal covered it from the west. The ring of the YSER also dramatically shorted the Belgian army's area of operations. Such a move would have abandoned Paschendale and Ypres and would have certainly meant the capture of Ostend while further reducing the amount of Belgian territory still free by a few square miles. On 23 May, the French tried to conduct a series of offensives against the German defensive line on the Ardennes-Calais axis but failed to make any meaningful gains. 
Meanwhile, on the Belgian front, the Belgians, under pressure, retreated further, and the Germans captured Ternusen and Ghent that day. The Belgians also had trouble moving the oil, food and ammunition that they had left. The Luftwaffe had air superiority and made everyday life hazardous in logistical terms. Air support could only be called in by wireless, and the RAF was operating from bases in southern England which made communication more difficult. The French denied the use of the Dunkirk, Berborg and Gravelines bases to the Belgians, which had initially been placed at its disposal. The Belgians were forced to use the only harbours left to them, at Newport and Ostend. Churchill and Maxime Wagen, who had taken over command from Gamelin, were still determined to break the German line and extricate their forces to the south. When they communicated their intentions to King Leopold and Van Overstraten on 24 May, the latter was stunned. A dangerous gap was starting to open between the British and Belgians between Ypres and Menin, which threatened what remained of the Belgian front. The Belgians could not cover it, such a move would have overstretched them. Without consulting the French or asking permission from his government, Gord immediately and decisively ordered the British 5th and 50th Infantry Divisions to plug the gap and abandon any offensive operations further south. On the afternoon of 24 May, von Bock had thrown four divisions, of Reichenau's 6th Army, against the Belgian 4th Corps position at the Kortrijk area of the Leia during the Battle of the Lys. 1940. The Germans managed, against fierce resistance, to cross the river at night and force a one-mile penetration along a 13-mile front between Wevik and Kortrijk. The Germans, with superior numbers and in command of the air, had won the bridgehead. Nevertheless, the Belgians had inflicted many casualties and several tactical defeats on the Germans. The 1st, 3rd, 9th and 10th Infantry Divisions, acting as reinforcements, had counterattacked several times and managed to capture 200 German prisoners. Belgian artillery and infantry were then heavily attacked by the Luftwaffe, which forced their defeat. The Belgians blamed the French and British for not providing air cover. The German bridgehead dangerously exposed the eastern flank of the southward stretched BEF's 4th Infantry Division. Montgomery dispatched several units of the 3rd Infantry Division including the heavy infantry of the 1st and 7th Middlesex Battalions and the 99th Battery, 20th Anti-Tank Regiment, as an improvised defence, a critical point of the Wagen Plan, and the British government and French Army's argument for a thrust south, was the withdrawal of forces to see the offensive through which had left the Belgian army overextended and was instrumental in its collapse. It was forced to cover the areas held by the BEF in order to enable the latter to engage in the offensive. Such a collapse could have resulted in the loss of the channel ports behind the Allied front, leading to a complete strategic encirclement. The BEF could have done more to counterattack von Bock's left flank to relieve the Belgians as von Bock attacked across the fortified British position at Kortrijk. The Belgian High Command made at least five appeals for the British to attack the vulnerable left flank of the German divisions between the Scheldt and the Leia to avert disaster. Admiral Sir Roger Keyes transmitted the following message to GHQ Van Overstraten is desperately keen for strong British counterattack. Either north or south of Leia could help restore the situation. Belgians expect to be attacked on the Ghent front tomorrow. Germans already have a bridgehead over Canal west of Eclu. There can be no question of the Belgian withdrawal to YSER. One battalion on March Ney of Ypres was practically wiped out today in attack by 60 aircraft. Withdrawal over open roads without adequate fighter support very costly. Whole of their supplies are east of YSER. They strongly represent attempt should be made to restore the situation on Leia by British counterattack for which opportunity may last another few hours only. No such attack came. The Germans brought fresh reserves to cover the gap men in Ypres. This nearly cut the Belgians off from the British. The 2nd, 6th and 10th Cavalry Divisions frustrated German attempts to exploit the gap in depth but the situation was still critical. On 26 May, Operation Dynamo officially commenced, in which large French and British contingents were to be evacuated to the United Kingdom. By that time, the Royal Navy had already withdrawn 28,000 British non-fighting troops. Boulogne had fallen and Calais was about to, leaving Dunkirk, Ostend and Zeebrugge as the only viable ports which could be used for evacuation. The advance of the 14th German Army would not leave Ostend available for much longer. To the west, the German Army Group A had reached Dunkirk and were 4 miles .4 kilometers from its center on the morning of 27 May, bringing the port within artillery range. The situation on 27 May had changed considerably from just 24 hours earlier. 
The Belgian army had been forced from the Leia line on 26 May, and Neville, Weinicket, Tielt and Isegem had fallen on the western and central part of the Leia front. In the east, the Germans had reached the outskirts of Bruges, and captured Ursel. In the west, the menin ypres line had broken at Kortrijk and the Belgians were now using railway trucks to help form anti-tank defences on a line from ypres Poschendale Rowlers. Further to the west the BEF had been forced back, north of Lille just over the French border and was now in danger of allowing a gap to develop between themselves and the Belgian southern flank on the Ypres-Lille axis. The danger in allowing a German advance to Dunkirk would mean the loss of the port which was now too great. The British withdrew to the port on 26 May. In doing so, they left the French First Army's northeastern flank near Lille exposed. As the British moved out, the Germans moved in, encircling the bulk of the French army. Both Gort and his chief of staff, General Henry Pownall, accepted that their withdrawal would mean the destruction of the French First Army, and they would be blamed for it. The fighting of 26 to 27 May had brought the Belgian army to the brink of collapse. The Belgians still held the Ypres Rowlers line to the west, and the Bruges Thelt line to the east. However, on the 27th of May, the Central Front collapsed in the Isegem Thelt sector. There was now nothing to prevent a German thrust to the east to take Ostend and Bruges, or west to take the ports at Newport or La Panne, deep in the Allied rear. The Belgians had practically exhausted all available means of resistance. The disintegration of the Belgian army and its front caused many erroneous accusations by the British. In fact, on numerous occasions, the Belgians had held on after British withdrawals. One example was the taking over of the Scheldt Line, where they relieved the British 4th Infantry Division, allowing it to retire through their ranks. Despite this, Gort and to a greater extent Pownall, showed anger at the Belgian King's decision to surrender on 28 May, considering it undercut the war effort. When it was inquired if any Belgians were to be evacuated, Pownall was reported to have replied, We don't care a bugger what happens to the Belgians. Belgian surrender The Belgian army was stretched from Cadzen south to Menon on the river Leia, and west, from Menon, to Bruges without any sort of reserves. With the exception of a few RAF sorties, the air was exclusively under the control of the Luftwaffe, and the Belgians reported attacks against all targets considered an objective, with resulting casualties. No natural obstacles remained between the Belgians and the German army, retreat was not feasible. The Luftwaffe had destroyed most of the rail networks to Dunkirk, just three roads were left, bruges torhout dixmude bruges gestels newport and Bruges-Ostend-Newport. Using such axes of retreat was impossible without losses owing to German air supremacy as opposed to air superiority. Water supplies were damaged and cut off, gas and electricity supplies were also cut. Canals were drained and used as supply dumps for whatever ammunition and foodstuffs were left. The total remaining area covered just 1,700 square kilometers, and compacted military and civilians alike, of which the latter numbered some 3 million people. Under these circumstances Leopold deemed further resistance useless. On the evening of 27 May, he requested an armistice, Churchill sent a message to Keyes the same day, and made clear what he thought of the request. Belgian embassy here assumes from King's decision to remain that he regards the war as lost and contemplates a separate peace. It is in order to dissociate itself from this that the constitutional Belgian government has reassembled on foreign soil. Even if present Belgian army has to lay down its arms, there are 200,000 Belgians of military age in France, and greater resources than Belgium had in 1914 which to fight back. By present decision the king is dividing the nation and delivering it into Hitler's protection. Please convey these considerations to the king, and impress upon him the disastrous consequences to the Allies and to Belgium of his present choice. The Royal Navy evacuated general headquarters at Middlekirk and St. Andries, east of Bruges, during the night. Leopold III, and his mother Queen Mother Elizabeth, stayed in Belgium to endure five years of self-imposed captivity. In response to the advice of his government to set up a government in exile Leopold said, I have decided to stay. The cause of the Allies is lost. The Belgian surrender came into effect at 4 o'clock on 28 May. Recriminations abounded with the British and French claiming the Belgians had betrayed the alliance. In Paris, the French Premier Paul Reynaud denounced Leopold's surrender, and the Belgian Premier Hubert Pierlot informed the people that Leopold had taken action against the unanimous advice of the government. 
As a result, the king was no longer in a position to govern and the Belgian government in exile that was located in Paris later moved to London following the fall of France would continue the struggle. The chief complaint was that the Belgians had not given any prior warning that their situation was so serious as to capitulate. Such claims were largely unjust. The Allies had known, and admitted it privately on 25 May through contact with the Belgians, that the latter were on the verge of collapse. Churchill's and the British response was officially restrained. This was due to the strong willed defence of the Belgian defensive campaign presented to the cabinet by Sir Roger Keyes at 11.30 am 28 May. The French and Belgian ministers had referred to Leopold's actions as treacherous, but they were unaware of the true events. Leopold had not signed an agreement with Hitler in order to form a collaborative government, but an unconditional surrender as commander in chief of the Belgian armed forces. Topic: <coughs> Casualties. The casualty reports include total losses at this point in the campaign. The figures for the Battle of Belgium, 10-28 May 1940, cannot be known with any certainty. <inaudible> Belgian Belgian casualties stood at Killed in action, 6,093 and 2,000 Belgian prisoners died in captivity Missing, more than 500 Captured, 200,000 Wounded, 15,850 Aircraft, 112 destroyed. Topic. French Numbers for the Battle of Belgium are unknown, but the French suffered the following losses throughout the entire Western Campaign, 10 May to of June. Killed in action, 90,000 Wounded, 200,000 Prisoners of war, 1,900,000 Total French losses in aircraft numbered 264 from 12 to the 25th of May and 50 for the 26th of May to the 1st of June. Topic: <inaudible> British. Numbers for the Battle of Belgium are unknown, but the British suffered the following losses throughout the entire campaign: the 10th of May to the 22nd of June. 68,111 killed in action, wounded or captured. 64,000 vehicles destroyed or abandoned 2,472 guns destroyed or abandoned RAF losses throughout the entire campaign the 10th of May to the 22nd of June amounted to 931 aircraft and 1,526 casualties. Casualties to the 28th of May are unknown. Total British losses in the air numbered 344 between 12 and 25 May, and 138 between 26 May and 1 June. German The consolidated report of the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht regarding the operations in the West from 10 May to 4 June German, Zusammenfassender Bericht des Oberkommandos der Wehrmacht über die Operationen im Westen vom 10. Mai bis 4. Juni reports Killed in action, 10,232 officers and soldiers Missing, 8,463 officers and soldiers Wounded, 42,523 officers and soldiers. Losses of the Luftwaffe from 10 May to 3 June, 432 aircraft. Losses of the Kriegsmarine, none. See also Battle of the Netherlands Free Belgian forces German invasion of Luxembourg Mechelen incident Topic References Topic Notes Topic Citations Topic Bibliography Topic Further reading